Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mark Langenfeld and Tamara Thompson. Tamara's with the Wisconsin Historical Society and was born in Bethesda, Maryland and went to high school at Carmel High School near Indianapolis, Indiana. She came to UW-Madison to get her undergraduate degree in horticulture and agronomy, stayed here to get a master's degree in plant breeding, and then like most people who get degrees in plant biology like myself, went to work for the Wisconsin Historical Society. <laughs> which is where she's been since 2004. And Mark Langenfeld was born in Racine, Wisconsin, as was my dad. He went to Washington Park High School, as did my dad, and I understand everybody just calls it Park High School, is that correct? That's right. And came to UW-Madison to get a degree in journalism, and the Department of Journalism was at what location? About where we're standing. It was in yep. the old Wisconsin High Building, 425 Henry Mall. Yep, so it was here at 425 Henry Mall before this building was uh, put up in 1995. And then he got his law degree here at UW-Madison in 1985. They are going to talk to us about one of the more extraordinary stories I've seen in a long time. Diving into the flooded mines of Baraboo's Iron Range is what I call it. I think they're calling it. That's An archaeological fine. analysis of the mines of the Baraboo Iron Range. So please join me in welcoming both Tamara Thompson and Mark Langenfeld to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, if, candidly, I'm stunned to see this many faces, and, and uh, it's been kind of cold, and uh, I didn't know whether there'd be one or none, or certainly didn't expect this many. So thanks for coming out, and uh, we hope we'll uh, make this presentation worth your while. It's a little unusual. Uh, the Baraboo Iron Mines, well, who, who, who'd have thunk Baraboo? And, and my job here, I'm not a diver. Well, I am a diver, but I'm not one of the divers that is doing the work in the mines. I'm here to provide a geological and historical context for the amazing stuff that Tammy's going to show you in a little while. So let's get, to, let's get to that. If you're really interested in this subject, I'm going to start right out by pointing you at probably the best extant resource on the iron mines of the Baraboo Range. This was a, uh, an issue, the vol volume 36, number 4, December 2003 of the Mid-Continent Railway Gazette. I don't know if any of you have been up to the Mid-Continent Railway Museum in North Freedom, but they have a very nice publication. It's a quarterly, usually. This was a special issue uh, that they put out specifically on the iron mines up there. And they did so because the rail line on which the museum train operates is actually the same rail lines that service these mines. They, this particular rail line was put in to service these iron mines. So uh, if, you're, if you find yourself stimulated and excited about this and you want more information, this particular issue has been reprinted and is available at the museum, probably by uh, uh, email order if you go to their website. I haven't checked that, so I don't know. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, and I have to learn how to use this mouse, the fact of the matter is, Few people connect Baraboo with mining. I mean, you think of Devil's Lake State Park, uh, you think of Circus World Museum, you think of the, the ties with the Ringling Brothers, but you don't think of mining, you just, you, you just don't. But one thing that maybe you have heard of, certainly most geologists practicing in this area uh, know about, is a thing called the Baraboo Syncline. Now, I'm not going to get too technical here, but uh, basically what a syncline is is a big deformation of the bedrock. Uh, if you have uh, a, a major disturbance where you have pressure 
in the bedrock moving inward, one of two things can happen. The bedrock can buckle upward and create a thing called an anticline, or it can buckle downward and create a thing called a syncline. And what we have uh, in the Baraboo area is a big geological feature called a syncline, the bedrock buckled downward. I think, I'm not a geologist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express, you know that. Um, <laughs> I, th I think there's still legitimate debate on what caused, what forces caused that syncline to occur. I think there's general agreement that it was about 1.8 billion years ago. I could be off by a fraction of a billion. But about, uh, about 1.8 billion years ago, uh, some force from the south-southeast and some counter force from the north-northwest exerting enough force to actually buckle these rocks. Uh, it, you know, what, what an astounding thing that must have been, and it probably occurred over a long period of time. Uh, but there it is. This, is. this is the remnant of that event, or those events. Um, and just to give you, I'm going to use this little cursor here. The city of Baraboo lies right about in here. This, this syncline, if you can envision it, is kind of a squat canoe. Uh, you get the picture. Baraboo kind of sits up here in the bow. And LaRue, where we're going to be doing a lot of work, kind of sits semi toward the stern down in the, the canoe. All right, now if, if you think of cutting a cross section through the syncline north and south, roughly along the line of Highway 12 going north and south. Uh, this is roughly what it looks like. Um, now, once upon a time, all these beds of rocks were pretty much horizontal. But when that smashing force occurred, it got forced into this sort of a um, canoe, for lack of a better word. And looking at <clears throat> the cross section, this would be the north range here, what's called the north range, and the south range over here, that would sort of be the gunnels of the canoe. And what's in here is sort of in the bilges. Okay, you get the picture? Um, now, initially, that north range and that south range were a good deal higher. In fact, you could even argue that they were mountainous. We're looking at, I think, now the geologists are, may pillory me here, but I, I think there was at least 1,000 feet of relief and probably quite a bit more than that. Um, those over the years were eroded by various forces. They were weathered down into the outcrops of Baraboo Quartzite that you see today. Devil's Lake is probably the, the most classic of the outcrops. And, and this Baraboo Quartzite is good stuff. It's very old, very tough rock. Uh, it's been quarried for many, many years uh, at um, North Freedom. Uh, if, if you see this characteristic pinkish rock uh, used as railroad ballast along railroad right-of-ways, that's the so-called pink lady rock that's uh, been quarried at North Freedom for many years. It's very old, very tough rock. Um, the, the Formations which used to overlie that Baraboo Quartzite were pretty much stripped away by erosional forces and glaciation. But the thing is, is you've got this syncline, and it has a bilge in it, and it sort of trapped those, uh, those overlying formations right in this area. So they're kind of preserved there, but they've disappeared everywhere else. They've just been ground away, washed away, and so on and so forth. What, what, uh, what color is the Baraboo Quartzite? Anybody? No? Red, I heard a red. Yeah, reddish purple. What does that indicate to you? Iron. Yeah, there's iron up there somewhere. And sure enough, there is actually iron formation. And by the way, iron is everywhere. Iron is everywhere through the Midwest, through the world, everywhere. Uh, the question is how rich is the iron? Is it economic? It turns out that in one of these bilge formations, if you want to call it that, is a thing called the freedom, dolomite. And 
adjacent to that freedom dolomite is a pretty thick, pretty rich iron formation. All right, that's trapped in the synclinal basin. Now, small deposits of that, small outcrops of that were discovered and mined pretty early on, primarily for use as pigment in paint. You want to know why Wisconsin barns are painted red? <laughs> Iron pigment paint is extremely durable. It's extremely cheap. Um, there are several places in Wisconsin where iron paint was manufactured. This is one. There's another over, uh, over near Iron Ridge. Does that ring a bell? Hmm? You know what I'm talking about? Between here and Hartford? And where Hartford is. There's a little place called Iron Ridge. There's a place called Mayville. They tried to smelt the iron over there, but it, it turned out to be very brittle iron. So it wasn't useful for that, but they sure did make a lot of paint. But anyway, they were mining for paint up here as early as the 1880s. All right, let me recover my cursor here. Now, some other people had bigger ideas for Baraboo iron. Uh, they started prospecting for higher grade ores in about 1887, but it was a little on the disorganized side. What you're looking at here is a steam drill. Uh, steam drilling, uh, core drilling was pioneered by a chap by the name of Longyear. Long story, I won't get into it, uh, in the Minnesota Iron Ranges. This is a Longyear type core drill. Uh, right around the turn of the last century, 1900, a chap from Minnesota by the name of G.W. LaRue brought down his steam drills, core drills, and crews and began prospecting deeper for richer ores. And they found it. And it wasn't all that deep. It was within the first three, 400 feet from surface, which is important when you're talking economics. Uh, they, were, they were greatly encouraged by this, and LaRue and his partners formed an outfit called the Sauk County Land and Mining Company, and they called it that because obviously they had to acquire land that um, had rich mineral deposits underneath it. And they soon started reporting finding deposits of greater than 50% uh, ore, which is, you know, iron is not like gold. I mean, you're not going to make a huge amount of money of it, out of it. So the richer it is, the more economic it is to develop. So when they said, we've got ore here that's better than 50% iron, antennae went out. The other thing that uh, worked in their favor is the Chicago Northwestern Railroad already had rails into this area. So the combination of LaRue's finds and rail service made it seem like almost a sure thing. And there was great excitement and the boom was on. Uh, LaRue and his uh, cohorts immediately began leasing land for mineral development around the area. One of the first to take them up on it was an outfit called Deering Harvester out of Chicago. Now they manufactured farm equipment, and we'll get into that in a minute. They were looking for a, a fairly nearby source of iron ore that they could take to Chicago and smelt into iron for their uh, farm implements, the manufacture of their farm implements. They formed, and they, by they, I mean uh, Deering Harvester, formed the Illinois Mining Company in 1901. And they came up and they started doing some drilling of their own. By that time, uh, they had uh, merged and acquired some other businesses and were known as International Harvester. And that should ring a bell with you. Uh, they finally leased land for a mine in 1903. And about the same time as this, and by the way, I should move on to the next slide here. Uh, well, that's not working. There we go. All right. Okay, very good. Uh, about the same time, uh, the Iroquois Iron Company, uh, which was also affiliated with a Chicago steel mill, acquired some property about a mile away. And uh, they also leased that land and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. So anyway, after a couple of false starts, the Illinois mine reached its finally, final configuration uh, 
And you can see here the head frame on the Illinois mine, and there's some rails in it that kind of go down. Oops, I'm not tracking them very well. They go down on an angle, about like that. They sank a 400-foot shaft that went down about a 60-degree angle into the ground. So this is not a minor operation. As you can see, there was a fairly substantial investment in infrastructure, and the, the mine was pretty deep, 400, 400 feet. Now this, this picture was taken circa 1907, so this is actually fairly late in the mine's life. It's pretty mature in this, uh, in this image. This is a schematic cross-section of the mine. You can see the 60-degree incline shaft goes down to a cross cut at the 300. And the plan view there shows the cross cut at the 300 foot level, which goes out into the ore formation. And then they proceeded east and west along the ore formation, stoping it out and removing it and hoisting it to surface. They also went down to the 400 foot level, drove a similar cross cut into the ore body. They had to go a little farther and stoped east and west and removed the ore. Now, the 400-foot level was a little thicker, but the ore was slightly lower grade. But that'll give you a general idea how the mine was laid out. And let's see if I can make this work. Up here is where that head frame and shaft was located in the, in the image. The ore was a soft red hematite. It was easy to mine, and reportedly it smelted very well. The International Harvester was pleased. Now, at its peak, this mine was operating 24-7, three shifts a day. There were 200 employees. They were Finnish, German, Swedish, and Englishmen, mostly Cornishmen. I don't know if you know about the connection of Cornwall and Cornishmen to mining, but it's a very close one. Uh, it was a very busy place. Uh, Tammy will show you some images, I think, that show you the string town of miners' housing that grew up just to the south of the mine. The mine had a hotel on site. Uh, it was a big operation and it was well financed by International Harvester. Um, in mid-1904, the mine was shipping about four of these 40-ton rail cars of ore to Chicago for smelting. Um, and by the, the end of that year, they were already increasing their production to between 5 and 12 of those car loads per day. So that was a fairly hefty tonnage considering the practices that were used, which was largely hand mining at that time. It was not heavily mechanized. This was purely pick, shovel, dynamite, and the strength of men's backs. This is a photograph of the mine's very first shipment in 1904. You can see it went out with some ballyhoo. Uh, and again, th these are the tracks that are uh, used today by the Mid-Continent Museum. So there's some real connection. You can also see that LaRue was a fairly booming little community at that time. They had plotted, uh, planted this community out for immense growth. Of course, it never <coughs> happened, but they had it planted. Um, well, the fact of the matter is, despite the ballyhoo, despite the labor, despite the production, they never made a penny on this mine. It was basically a loser. Uh, and they applied their best efforts, both technologically and in terms of dedicated labor, but it just did not work out. Uh, by 1908, operations were suspended, and uh, the mine never reopened. Uh, existing ore, however, was continued to be uh, sold off the stockpiles until about 1916, when it was essentially depleted. By 1925, Every stick of that structure, every stick of uh, the or every bit of the equipment, every stick of the structure had either been removed or repurposed. It was gone. The site basically was indistinguishable as a mine. Now, the Iroquois Mining Company that I mentioned a moment ago uh, began uh, erecting buildings and sinking a shaft in 1903. Now. They were targeting uh, uh, an ore body that was quite deep, about 500 feet, but it had shown up in drill cores, exploration drill cores, at 63% ore. I mean, it really looked 
good. Um, however, the company had difficulties with financing and also some engineering problems, so they suspended operations by the end of 1904, and the project laid dormant for four years. Uh, in March of 1908, the Oliver Mining Company, which is a subsidiary of United States Steel, uh, acquired the whole property, the whole shoot and match, and they renamed it the Iroquois Mine, and they revived the project with substantial financial backing which their predecessor just didn't have. And that money built a, a really thoroughly modern stone and brick powerhouse, a uh, big brick smokestack that you see here, uh, a substantial steel head frame that you can see in the background along with a, a loading trestle that ran across at right angles, uh, a, a major ore bin for holding raw ore that came up from underground, and they built an absolutely spectacular residence for their mine superintendent. And, and by the way, that is the only structure I know of that has survived. It was removed from the site and has been relocated in rural Sauk County and can still be seen today. But I, I kind of got ahead of myself here a little bit. Uh, you, you have to note the scale and sophistication of what's going on here um, at this mine site. I mean. Uh, it, it really mirrored the mining practice of northern Minnesota and upper Michigan, where the mining was extremely high tech and, and uh, everything was the best that money could buy. Quite different from the lead and zinc mines in southwestern Wisconsin, which were much smaller and by comparison basically primitive. Um, it, it's quite a contrast. The Baraboo Republic reported in November 1909, and I'm, I'm going to quote it now, and this is in reference to the Iroquois mine, all improvements being made about the place are of a permanent character and indicate that the ore under the ground is of vast extent and will require years to bring to the surface. Well, <laughs> that wasn't the way it turned out. <laughs> Continuous difficulties from the start. The Oliver Company abruptly stopped operations in May of 1914 and within months had dismantled and completely removed everything you see here. Everything was gone. So much for permanent. Well, just across the road from the Illinois mine that we looked at first, Captain C.T. Roberts, who was the last superintendent at the Illinois mine before it closed, later opened a small short live mine that bore his name. We're gonna be talking more about this mine. And if you look in the background there, you can see the inactive Illinois head frame. So it's very close, it's just across the road. And uh, the connection between C.T. Roberts, this mine, and the Illinois mine is an interesting connection that we are gonna explore a little bit later. Now I also wanna briefly mention the last and largest of the Baraboo Range iron mines. Uh, this is the Cahoon Mine. And it was an outlier. It was not in the North Freedom LaRue area. This one was actually almost within the city limits of Baraboo. Uh, it was opened by Pittsburgh Steel and Coal Investors in 1911. And it operated on two shifts almost continuously until 1919. And the shaft was sunk to 400 feet, and it had extensive multiple levels running east and west. Now, although the mining ended at the Cahoon in 1919, there was huge stockpiles of iron ore just below the mine, and there was continuous shipment of that ore until 1925. But that is the end of iron mining in Sauk County. I mentioned earlier that the Illinois mine had a couple of false starts before settling in on that 400 foot, 60 degree incline. I wanna talk just a little bit about that. Initially, uh, they tried sinking vertical shafts directly from the surface down to the iron ore body, as you can sort of see here. You can see how different the incline was. The incline went down at an angle and they had to drive cross cuts to reach the iron ore. Their original intent was to sink a vertical shaft straight down from the surface and hit the ore body right at the top. 
Well, they tried two of these vertical shafts, but abandoned both of them before reaching the ore, at least so far as we know before reaching the ore. We don't really know why they abandoned that and went to the other, although it was about coincidental with the arrival of Captain C.T. Roberts, who came down from Crystal Falls, Michigan. And he said, we're going to sink the incline shaft, and they did. Um, now, here's an image of one of those early vertical shaft sinking attempts. And you can see in the foreground a nice set of steam boilers and a hoist, and in the background a very crude temporary head frame. And the head frame is nothing more than a scaffold that holds a shiv wheel that the hoist rope goes over so that you can hoist straight up and down the shaft. Um, now, I want to digress just a little bit here and talk a little bit about shaft sinking circa turn of the last century because this is going to play a little part in Tammy's story, more than a little part. This is a drawing from a roughly 1908-1909 mining treatise of a, sh a shaft sinking operation. Now, steam power was big at the turn of the last century. Uh, industry of any kind, mining included, relied entirely on steam for power. Compressed air was just starting to come in mostly for drilling, but power was steam. Now this is the shaft way over here on the right. I'm doing a terrible job of this. This is the shaft going down to water. And you see a device down here at the bottom of the shaft and that is a pump. In the vernacular of the mining industry, that was called a sinking pump. They're sinking the shaft, and to keep the mine dry so they can work on it as they go deeper and deeper, they have a portable pump that goes down on a hoist. It's like a sump pump. Hmm? And they run this to the bottom of the shaft and pump the uh, water out of the sump or the bottom of the shaft. The problem with steam power, though, is it does not hold its energy for great distances. So this pump did not have sufficient capacity to raise that water all the way to surface. What they did was they excavated a pocket off the side of the shaft, part way down, built a sump into the floor of that pocket, and put in a much larger pumping engine at that level. What that allowed them to do is use the sinking pump to raise the water to the sump in that pumping station, and the more powerful pump would then pump that water to surface. So it was essentially a two-stage pumping operation. Everybody bored now? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Anyway, this is another picture of a typical sinking pump of that era. And I'm showing this to you only as a teaser for what is to come. All right. What killed the mines? Water. OK. All of these mines were underwater. All right. We're going to look at this uh, diagram here again. You see this, this whole formation here. Up here is glacial drift. This is just stuff deposited by departing glaciers. But this formation right here, which overlies uh, all of the iron formation in this district, is called the Potsdam sandstone. It's a very porous sandstone, and it is saturated. It's like a sponge. So if you try to work under the Potsdam sandstone, water comes down and down and down and tries to flood you out. There's a lot of water in 400 vertical feet of this porous rock. All right. So they had to pump continuously to stay ahead of that water. Um, in the Illinois mine, 2,600 gallons per minute. That cost dollars, a lot of dollars. And of course, what that did is went to the bottom line, and it made the Baraboo iron ores less economic than certain others. Now, the Sauk Iroquois mine also was very wet. 
And that created another unforeseen problem. Their ore, as you recall, 63% ore looked really good on those drill cores. But when they got underground, they found that that iron ore was so saturated, it was literally sweating water. And it was like red mud. When mined, it became what one reporter called a pasty mess. It was difficult to handle. It was difficult to process. Um, the salt mine also had to deal with pumping water. They had to um, extract six and a half million gallons a day out of that mine to keep it dry. It required 13 underground pumps to do that. So I'll give you a notion of the scale. I, I want to give you a, a notion of just how wet it was. And it can be gleaned from a, uh, an account of the mine's closure. And in the July 25th, 1914 edition of Mining and Engineering World, I know it's difficult to read. This vividly describes the battle with water. And I'll read you just a bit of it. Because with the machinery stopped, the mine was sure to be inundated within a few hours Great care and the greatest of expedition were required to recover the equipment too valuable to abandon. A bulkhead was constructed, bolts were loosened, and other preparations were made to get the pumps out of the mine in quick order, one at a time, once the hoisting was started. So well did the plans work out that only two small machines were left in the workings. The last pump taken out was in operation until within a few minutes of time, when slung in its chains, it was taken to the surface. The bulkhead, seven feet in height, was engulfed so quickly, the men barely had time to escape the rising flood. So, I mean, there are wet mines and there are wet mines. This was a wet mine. Well, water of a different sort also helped sound the death knell of the Baraboo Iron Mines, specifically the Great Lakes. <coughs> The growing Great Lakes bulk carrier fleet made it feasible for the immense iron mines in northern Minnesota and upper Michigan uh, to efficiently transport their ores down to the steel mills at the foot of the lakes. Uh, at first, the bearable ores could compete. They could be shipped to Chicago by rail for as little as 85 cents per ton. And initially, in accounting for docking charges, <coughs> Uh, the maritime shipments of the northern ores cost nearly as much. So the bearable mines were initially competitive, but as the size of the average laker or ore boat increased and the cost of operating them started to go down, that advantage quickly flip-flopped. Uh, for example, as early as 1906, the Minnesota Masabi range ores were being delivered by boat at International Harvester's Dock fully a 45 cent per ton advantage over the Illinois mine ores. The, the, the Baraboo ores just could not compete. In short, water destroyed these mines. But in a sense, it also preserved them. They are today like sunken historic shipwrecks, except they're underground shipwrecks. And this is now where Tammy is going to take you. Thank you. So if you give me a second here, I'm going to switch over um, the PowerPoint to mine here. So this is now. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we got involved um, with this. We have a, a really active cave diving community here in Wisconsin, which is kind of surprising to a lot of people. But we have about 70 uh, divers who are full cave diver trained. So it takes an awful lot of training, not just your basic open water training. But um, they learn to use technical diving equipment, and they take many levels, many years of advanced training uh, to be able to dive in caves. And so normally, or typically, when people learn to cave dive, they dive in the Floridian Aquifer. Or they go to Mexico and dive in the cenotes there. Um, but when you're stranded in Wisconsin, in the middle of winter, you start looking for um, any kind of water that you can, you can dive in. So we see my friend Jason here hiking through a cornfield in southwestern Wisconsin trying to find one of these mine sites. So we started um, 
because of our interest in caving and our familiarity with uh, with the Langenfelds, Mark and Lynn Langenfeld, we started asking them about a number of mine sites that they would know um, might still be open or accessible. And we started going through their collection of, um, of information that they had been gathering for a many number of years. And um, we, uh, we've been pretty successful in talking to landowners and, um, and sharing information on what, what treasures they have on their properties. So with, um, with their help, we discovered one of the, of the mines in, um, in the Baraboo Range. This is the Illinois mine, or the shaft uh, entrance to the Illinois. And this was um, one of the early ones that we found around 2007 up there. So granted, we had been looking at mines and working with the, mine, uh, the Langenfelds for almost 20 years. And this was um, kind of in the middle of our, our hunt for, for mines. And um, so this is uh, on the Pierce property. You see Dennis Pierce here and, and Keith Meverden, who's also in the audience. And we're looking at uh, three compartment shaft, which is the Illinois. Now, of course, Mark had been talking to you about the Illinois mine being one of the highest producing mines in the Baraboo Range. And, um, and this is really um, kind of an anomaly in, in their backyard. The Pierces had raised up the ground around where the shaft collar is here and, um, and added a few railroad ties uh, to prevent the wetland from taking over this area. And it really became an area for them to sit around and drink beers and party in their backyard. So, um, since the mine closed in uh, in 1908, there's been an, it's really that's been the common thread with with this with this shaft. There's been a lot of uh, trash dumped in it. So we found many generations of trash. We found um, farming equipment which had been there, and when we when we uh, removed that, there were um, beer cans from many generations, and um, and then. And when you got on top of that, there were um, laptop computers and other indiscretions people wanted to hide by throwing them down the mine shaft. It took us about seven years to remove everything um, from this to be able to clear out um, what it was that we found. And we did take a number of notes. This ends up being a three compartment shaft. So it's basically a three compartment elevator shaft. And you're in an area that's enclosed for the most of it in each one of those individual segments, which is five feet by four feet. So it's it's very enclosed. And if you think about this, the, cen the central area really would be the where the main elevator would run, and then there would be a switching manway, which would move from one side to the other. Um, so if the elevator, or if the, the lift could, would break, they could come up on the ladders and it wouldn't affect that. Um, so we, we have a couple interesting things that you can see um, in this drawing, and this is one of our early sketches that we did underwater. Um, so in that seven years of us, um, this was not like every day we would go up there and remove this. This was very sporadic. Um, but we would go up, a group of four or five of us, we would drop down one of the shafts and pull up a great big bag of trash. And then it would make the visibility and the clarity of the water mud. And so then the next person would come down, and they would fill a bag of trash by feel. And by the time the fourth person was down there, they were having no fun. And then it would take about a month for them to settle out. And then we would decide when we would want to go back up and try it all over again. And so I lost a good number of buddies. Um, and, um, and eventually, we got to the point where we could create something like this and see what we have. But you see, we've cleared it down to 130 feet. We know from the drawings that, we, that Mark was showing us earlier that this possibly could have gone as deep as 400 feet. So what lie below? Did we hit a debris clog? Did we, um, had we just needed to remove more? Had we hit the bottom? What is there? Um, but we see that there's um, a chain fall that we find at 95 feet. Um, there's, uh, there's lagging, which is, um, which is spelled out in here. And um, I wanted to share a little video. Um, from my friend uh, John Jansen, who's also in the audience here, of what it looks like uh, in the Illinois mine. So um, they've now added fence around it. It looks a little bit like a cemetery, but that was to prevent the, um, the grandchildren from falling into the open shaft. I know. And um, so you see that it's, it's much nicer than the trash pit that it was seven years prior. 
Um, you can see that it's very clean. We've spent a lot of time knocking a lot of the debris off or gathering it up and clearing it out. And you can see the lagging is, is open around the outside of the entire structure with the frames down the center. Um, as we progress deeper, and um, again, remember the, the Pierce family built this up um, a, a higher to reinforce it. So we get down into the actual mine. You start seeing ladders um, in the south um, side of the, of the compartment here. Um, and we're going down in the center. And then as we get down to about 40 feet, it closes in. And so you need to be in either, you need to choose which side you're in, um, whether you're in the central shaft or one side or the other. Um, you also see coming in um, on the, the far side of the screen um, parts of the skip guides. So these would have been um, the guides, they would have been greased, and then um, the, the platform or the elevator would have come up and down on these to bring workers down or to um, bring ore back up. There's one of the skip guides there. And you can see it's quite substantially built. So they put a lot of investment into this particular uh, shaft. And um, you see there's still some particulate in the water that gets knocked down despite us, uh, our best efforts. And uh, John's down at about 50 feet here looking up. Um, he's just down into the enclosed area. And he's going to continue down um, in a second here. So as he continues down, now he's in the area that's enclosed in, and he's looking down the elevator shaft. So this is really an elevator shaft, <laughs> and you're going straight down with the skips on either side. And this, um, this drops down to around the 100-foot level where it opens up again. Um, you can see that it's, uh, it's routed out on the one side. Um, I would imagine that's where, the, um, where there would have been a braking mechanism um, to slow down the um, the skip. So as we come down a little bit further, again, this is about four feet by five foot wide, and um, he's dropping through. So you can imagine this was all filled with trash. So each one of the three compartments. So again, it's a, it's a good number of times. So here we are, we open up into this other area. Now you can access either side of the three compartment shaft. And um, you can slip under the beams there and go into the other, um, the other compartment and look in. Or you can continue to drop down to the debris cone below. And you can see that some of the lagging has come free so over the years. Um, and if you look through that, you can either see that the rock wall has been gobbed behind it, so they've thrown rock in behind it, or you can see uh, the raw wa rock walls. Um, that is a hanger from one of the ladders um, that's fallen and has since dropped down to the bottom. So we had one of our divers um, get his fin caught in that little area and uh, ended up abandoning it. And we had to go back about a month later and look for it. So John now drops under the wall here. And um, he comes across this pump. Now you imagine for seven years, we had no idea this pump was there because it was completely <laughs> covered with garbage. And um, so it's, it's pretty um, unique. This is actually a sinking pump. And it's in place. And um, it's, it's interesting that he's so close to it. But remember, this shaft is 4 by 5. And now he's in the shaft with the pump and his monster camera. And um, so, so that's why you're getting extremely close up views. And, um, and you see the chain fall at the top as he continues up uh, the shaft, which is attached to one of the beams. So then as the water level would have been depleted, they would have lowered the, um, the the pump down, and then it would have been able to get more. We'll come back to that, uh, that mosaic in a minute. So now he's following up. Um, he's crossed over into the north side um, of the three compartment shaft, and he's continuing up. And as he comes up to about the 75 foot level, 
the lagging will stop and he's, you see the flange at the end of a, uh, of a pipe, which has been disconnected. Um, this goes into that pocket that Mark was talking about earlier, um, that where the pump, the stage pumping machinery would have been. So he heads back into this area, and again, you see that the visibility in the water has been disturbed because he went down the shaft before he came back up, um, and um, and he's going to head into this room following the pipe on the ceiling, and you can see that there are boards that are across the ceiling to prevent any um, loose rock from falling in on the, on the workers. And as he gets all the way back into this room, um, you can see that there's a false floor or remnants of it. Um, and this would have been where the sump would have been underneath. And they would have put the, um, the siphon to be able to suck up to go up to the surface. So that's the staged <coughs> pumping room. So um, I'm going to head on here and show you. This is the, um, the mosaic of the pump. Again, this is taken from images that John shot in his video. Um, and this is about 10 or 12 images, which I've stitched together to give you an overall feeling of that pump. And going back to the drawing that Mark showed you earlier, um, it, is, uh, it is this um, sinking pump, which is here. And this remains all the way up to the connection going into this room, which comes in and goes in here. Um, and then it's disconnected at this point right here. And the whole pumping mechanism has gone. So they either removed it or reutilized it somewhere else. Keep that in mind. Tammy, you might want to give them a sense of how tall that pump is. OK, so that pump is about 30 feet tall. So it's very, very long. So and um, and so and the um, the the siphon on the sinking pump is all the way at the bottom at 130 feet of water, so and that still is extant at the site. Okay, so uh, Mark had shown you this uh, this picture earlier um, of the uh, Mid Continent Gazette. Um, this is one of the reference materials that we had with us when we were doing the initial exploration up there, and we got very excited about uh, about this publication. And most of it, um, the Mid Continent Railroad is um, is really run by volunteers. There are a lot of guys that are very interested in, in railroads. And um, so on a sidetrack of research, one of their volunteers uh, named Don Ginter came up with all of this information on the mining, and then eventually it turned into this article in this, uh, in this gazette. Mark was able to track down Don Ginter, and he was in his 90s at the time. And um, he lived down just north of Beloit. And um, he invited us to come to his house for a few hours and go through his collection of materials which he had gathered to put together the article. And so um, he had no scanner or copying machine. And um, we, were, we went there um, with cell phones and cameras and took as many pictures of all of this collection of stuff that he had um, that we could in the three hours we were there. And amongst them were a number of photographs really showing the extent of the Illinois mine. In fact, most of his collection was based around the Illinois mine. That was his interest. And it turned out that um, because there was so much information, there was such this common interest between uh, Ginter, the interests of the, um, of the Mid-Continent Railroad and the Pierce family, their plans were to make a park on the Pierce family property and to really tell the history of the Illinois mine there by creating trails and having interpretive signs. And, um, and to show where you know, this full extent of operation, which was here in the, at the Illinois mine, what it looked like today. However, most of it looked like 
foundations which are covered um, by um, snarls of, um, of wild weeds and, um, and overgrown shrubbery. So Don Pierce then, um, bought, in his retirement, bought himself a skid loader and um, started removing a lot of this and cleaned up some of the foundations. And um, this is actually, this area would have been where the powerhouse is. And um, they cleared a bunch of trails on their property too, and they had a big vision for this property, which never came to fruition. Amongst his collection that Ginter had was a number of blueprints, and we, pr we found those to be very valuable. This is the Illinois mine, um, and we see here this is the rail cut, which goes along here. Um, this would have been the main shaft, which they are referring to as the number three shaft. And then the number two shaft here, where we're, which is open and diving. We didn't know where the number one shaft was, and that was really one of the things that we were going to go look for the next time we were out. Another thing within this collection which we found very interesting were um, plan view drawings of the cross cuts which were created by the mining engineers. So we could see exactly where the, um, where the drift was in reference to the, the shafts. Here's number two. And here's number one, and they don't connect at all um, with, uh, with the underground working. So as Mark had said earlier in his drawing, it was very, very much a mystery as to what was going on. We have the railroad cut here with the main shaft, the 60 degree, um, sorry, we did it again, the 60 degree um, decline here, and then the cross cuts going into the ore body. But we imagined that this would be, this, this line here would have been one of, the, um, one of the exploratory shafts, one of the original shafts, or used later as a dewatering shaft. What's also very interesting is that they show that similar line continuing on the second level and going out. So our question was, if this is the dewatering shaft or that, that um, that shaft number one or shaft number two, it's coming all the way down to the first level. And the first level is here at about 300 feet. So we have over 300 foot of direct descent down that three compartment shaft down into the ore body. And when was this drawing made? Had they then later connected this down to the fourth level at the 400 foot? So these are questions that we had as divers. Where were we going? How deep did it actually go? Um, also really interesting um, within the, the collection um, was, uh, was um, a couple of random pictures which uh, Mark has attributed to some of these vertical shafts in the number one and the number two, um, which gave us a little bit more of a feeling. I think this is the number two shaft just because of the geological, uh, the geology that's in the background. So from there we started on a treasure hunt and um, we decided to go walk transects through the swamp and see if we could find the number one shaft. Um, after many, this is uh, Don Pierce, or, or Dennis Pierce, uh, Don's the middle son, and um, he was all too eager to walk through um, and help us walk these transects and look for anything. Um, we were vastly unsuccessful except for finding some, um, some holes that were spouting out water, and, um, and that really is the story of the Illinois mine, was that uh, the pumps came out and the, and the LaRue mines were flooded. So come back to this uh, Mid-Continent Railway Gazette for a number of reasons. You see that the, the photo on the front, it's very compelling. And um, I mean, it's, uh, it says Robert's Mine, North Freedom, Wisconsin. But if you read that publication, which I've read and combed through multiple times, it talks about the Illinois, it talks about the Iroquois, and it talks about the Cahoon. And the only mention of the Captain Roberts is the photo on the cover. <laughs> Um, so I thought that I missed it or I was sleeping or just, you know, inadequate and my, re my following along, but there really isn't anything on the, on the Roberts mine. And so it took a little bit of digging. And again, going through more pictures and more information within this Don Ginter collection, we found, um, again, a, a few more photos of, of the Roberts mine. We see the, um, the buildings here with, again, Mark showed you with the Illinois in, in the background. Um, um, and the rail cut, so we should be able to find this on the landscape by what remnants are there today. 
Um, we also had a number of clippings. He, you know, he actually clipped things out and pasted them into a scrapbook, bless him. And, um, and so we, uh, I copied a lot of these and put them onto a piece of paper and we set off um, on, this is Memorial Day weekend in, um, in 2014 to try to find the Captain Roberts mine with, uh, armed with these four newspaper articles and a couple historic images. And so we were driving down, um, the highway into LaRue and there was a guy cutting his lawn and um, I thought that might be the right area and we pulled over and we stopped and it's um, actually the gentleman in the back which is uh, the background with the white hat which is uh, Greg Georgeson here and he and his wife had their camper pulled up for the weekend on this property and they were trimming the weeds and I said to I pulled over with my four pieces of paper and I said I don't know if I'm crazy but I think that there's a mind on your property or might have been and um i've been doing this research on the illinois mine across the street would would there be a mine here do you know what i'm talking about well he said oh my goodness you're not going to believe what i have in my backyard and so he walked us out there and again they have this fence which they've um, i guess oversold in baraboo and um they has this surrounding his um his uh, hole in the ground and he said well this we've been trying to raise fish in this thing and um, he said but uh, but I, I we imagined it was a mine shaft and they really didn't know what to what was down there but they were really willing to to learn and they w wanted to know he said to us he said um, so he says um, do you think you can dive here today we'd already made arrangements to go diving over at the Pierce property so I said well you know we should go dive over there because we already in had talked to the landowner. I said, but we'll come over this afternoon. He says, well, if you come back, we're going to make you steak. So how could we say no? You know, and I don't know if any of you are, like, are cavers or, or have um, gone out looking, trying to get onto property. It never happens like this. Um, but uh, I have a little bit of video from um, John Scholes, which I want to show you, um, of what, uh, what it looks like um, underwater in their property. So it, again, it, uh, they didn't spend the hundred years um, throwing uh, throwing trash down the Captain Roberts, but you see this. We spent about two hours cleaning this out, and this is on the second day. And as he's dropping down, this is the first time we're dropping down with a camera and um, looking into um, the mine. And so as he drops down to seventy five feet, we see the um, the the pipes going into the room and here is that uh, stage dewatering pump which Mark hypothesizes may have been um, taken from the Illinois. The story is that um, when Captain Roberts, um, when they closed the Illinois in, in 1908, Captain Roberts didn't believe that the ore was done, and he obtained rights to the property across the road. And to drive his shaft, he had 23 men remain on to help him sink it, and he robbed power from the Illinois. Well, of course, he had the keys. So, um, and then it took him a few months to get enough money and, um, and to build the buildings himself and to bring his own boiler in and be able to start mining on that property. So if he was going to be robbing power from them, why not take equipment that was left too? So this may in fact be the pump that's missing over in the Illinois. So I'm swimming here. That's me in the picture here. I'm swimming forward of John Scholes and I'm putting a guideline out, so that's very typical in cave diving, that you would run a guideline along so that if there are you know, cross-cut tunnels or you get lost or something happens, you can find your way back out. And um, so, and as Mark was saying that in, in his article that he read, there was basically, a, they had minutes to get out of the mine. I believe that, and I, I use this all the time, I say, oh, it's a time capsule, these things are time capsules. This is literally a time capsule. This was like run for, you know, they left their tools in place. There's a, um, an ore cart, a single ore cart on the track with a pickaxe in it, it's empty. And next to it stands a post drill, which has the bits 
still in the borehole and bits remaining at the base of it. And you can see the compressed air line running to it. By the way, um, we discovered when we were looking at some of the video of this that they were, that was a very, very early post drill. It was not run with water. It was only run with compressed air. So um, that's what they call, Mark calls the widow maker. And um, so here he is swimming down the, um, the tracks toward, uh, towards the end of the, um, the drift here. And as we're coming into this area, you can see I'm doing very specific kicks. These are used in cave diving um, to avoid stirring up the bottom. So I'm not doing the flutter kick. It's a frog kick, which throws the water up. And you can also see that I'm using a rebreather, which doesn't produce any bubbles. So there's no percolation falling on me from the ceiling, which is probably a good thing because I'm going into an area here which is framed off. And you see that above it is logs which have been split and put atop to form a ceiling to keep the uh, rock from falling down onto the miners or the, the carts which are below. Um, and as I swim further, you see balanced along the wall here is um, a scaling bar. And the scaling bar would have been used to pry and ram the ceiling before the workers would go down to try to get the rock to come loose so there wouldn't be any accidents. So, and you can see the compressed air lines on either side of the tracks, which are continuing in. And um, as we get all the way in here, um, there's a candle holder on the, on the wall here with some wire wrapped around it. I, I don't believe that they had lighting, although they may have been attempting to put some in at some point. Um, but we'll see later on in this video that they actually did mine this by candle because there's a number of tallow candles um, which are on the ceiling. I'm coming now to the end of the drift. And um, as I come down here, I'm going, you see that there are rail tracks which are set along the side, spare ones to be put down um, as they would continue mining. And um, I tie off my line and attach it to the end of the, the rail track um, because the tunnel goes no further. So you can see that um, an, as I came out of the area too that uh, was uh, framed over the top, um, there had been a ceiling collapse or rock fall, and it's uncertain whether um, the ceiling had broken off or they had used that scaling bar to drop the ceiling, and then um, they were going to start cleaning that up, and in the process, um, the pump broke and the mine flooded. Um, but um, the one thing that we noticed when we were looking at the pump itself is that it had um, a toolbox which was set atop, of, atop it with uh, spare parts and um, there was a toolbox set alongside it as well which, um, which had uh, tools which were sort of um, spewed out on the floor. So I do believe that, that this was the story with this particular uh, mine when it closed anyway was that they had been working on that pump and that and the auxiliary pump were not working at all, and um, they had a matter of minutes to escape. So as we're heading back here, again, you can see some of the rail tracks which are um, set as alongside this to continue, and we go back to uh, where the drill is and um, the area that's stoped out in this area here. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing to think that this was mined um, only for a year and a half and that they had this almost 160 feet of tunnel um, uh, put in. So pretty amazing. So if you're setting up an exhibit on what it looked like to mine in the Baraboo Range, um, this is pretty much it. You see tools stacked alongside um, a shovel, a pickaxe, pick another scaling bar. And um, as I head over this way, I'm going to signal to John to come and check out the tallow candles above me. See the compressed air line running in um, as we approach the shaft. So he'll pan back up in a second here, and you'll see a number of these um, tallow candles, which um, these are all, um, you know, uh, 
animal fat candles which are just uh, scattered on the ceiling and left um, left there. So either a box broke loose or they had a stack of them um, set there at the entrance and they were bringing them into the mine with them. As we come back into the shaft here too, um, he is going to go up the uh, skip guides um, all the way to the surface. Um, and um, you can see it's a very different looking shaft because it only had about two hours of cleaning and well again not not as many uh, not as many years of uh, of people throwing things into it it was not the party spot so we had the fortune um, in November of this year to have a visit from the 2017 Our World Underwater Rolex Scholar. So her name is Leah Potts, and she's here in the water. And she came to us. She wanted to have an experience in underwater archaeology, um, but she could only come to Wisconsin in November. <laughs> so, um, but she came to us with. So we didn't want to take her on the Great Lakes because you know the gales of November and all that. So we and we were you know we do the exciting part usually in archaeology of writing papers and um, cleaning up field equipment in November. So we decided, since she came to us with this unique set of skills, she was a cave diver. She um, knew how to dive on a rebreather. She's using this recirculating device. And um, that we would try to, uh, to go up and take a look at the, um, the Captain Roberts mine here and see if we could uh, um, we could survey this. So I was put up a challenge from, uh, from my boss, the state archaeologist, John Broyhan. He sent me an article, which was from the SHA, the Society for Historic Archaeology, saying that there was a lot of work that had been done on um, terrestrial sites, but not a whole lot that had continued underwater and looked at the underwater inundated workings um, of some of these mine sites. So the person in the foreground here is Paul Reck. He is um, with the Museum Archaeology Program at the Wisconsin Historical Society. He's a terrestrial archaeologist. He usually does DOT work, you know, when they're moving a highway. He'll go out ahead of time and make sure they're not moving it on top of any important um, archaeological sites. So he came and helped us, and he surveyed a lot of the top side um, features. They're not very exciting. You see this is their burn pit, which actually at one time in its, its life had been, um, had been the uh, powerhouse for the... Uh, Captain Roberts, but he discovered a lot of interesting things. You can see here the mining graffiti um, that was written into um, the foundation. I have no idea what that reads, but I'm, I'm hopeful that as we, this was only November when we collected this information, that it's a, it'll make sense in another couple months, and we'll be able to tell you what this means. Anybody tell, want to guess? No? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's what it says? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I see a whole lot of things. <laughs> so, so again, we see here um, this this unique and maybe first uh, time where we have uh, terrestrial archaeologists. Uh, this is Paul Reckner with the Trimble walking the uh, collar of the mine with my colleague Caitlin Zant below, um, documenting the shaft. And um, and so uh, so we were able to uh, create a scaled. Uh, drawing a site plan of what we have under underwater, and you can see that we've um, documented the entire drift. The shaft would have been here, and then the drift would continue on um, in this direction. You see two stopes, which are associated with uh, the site. Um, and this one would have been the primary one. That probably is where they were initiating some cross cuts uh, or had hoped to. And then over um, on the far side here, we have the pump room here, um, where everything, uh, all the, the, the two uh, dewatering pumps would have been uh, set. Um, above here, we have, um, in this area, a vertical cross section. And we see, as Mark had explained, what's typical um, in these mines to take uh, the pressure off the pump is that they would have a stage pumping area. So we have here the um, regular pump, uh, the watering pump on the bottom. And we have this area here, which would have been um, the staged area for pumping. May have been the first pumping as they were, as they were sinking the shaft. <laughs> 
or it may uh, have been one that they had set up and were anticipating as they were continuing deeper because some of the articles um, that they had said they were going to 150 feet and this is in fact only at 75. So maybe they had anticipated coming halfway up to this point now and then um, and then uh, putting another pump in here with the sump area beyond. So another thing Leah had as in her in her toolbox was she had just come to us from Malta where she had learned some photogrammetry. So she had learned to take uh, photos and create 3D models. So this is at a weird angle just so that you can get a full perspective of the ore cart. But um, you can see um, it, it's pretty nice. There's a couple uh, little errors in the um, in the model but you can't see the wheels on the one side. It was too close to the pump, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what that, um, of what that ore cart looks like. And um, we were also able to create this model of uh, the post drill. If you look, the, the program extrapolated the boreholes out on the back side of the image, which is kind of interesting. And you can see the uh, post drill here um, set up and, and working. So you see the, the, the holes extrapolated in the back. That's kind of, I think it's kind of fun. So Paul Reckner is able to finish his uh, top side um, survey for us too, and in doing so, he acquired. Um, so he surveyed where um, all the foundations were of um, of the buildings that we could find. He figured out where the um, rail line had been, although there's very little evidence of it on the surface. But as you see across the street, it continues on and go through the cut that comes into the Illinois mine and the property across the road, and that is still um, extant. So he went and obtained some LIDAR images from Sauk County. And what's very interesting is although we treat these as two separate sites, the Illinois and then the, the, um, the Captain Roberts across the street, it, it's kind of hard to separate sometimes because we see here is that rail cut for the Illinois and you can see where it came then across the road um, and uh, connected with the, um, with the Captain Roberts. Here's the uh, shaft for the Captain Roberts which exists and the, the stream which comes out of it as it's flowing into the wetland. Um, but what we did with this is we went back to that blueprint that Don Ginter had and we superimposed the two. And um, we know that we were in the number two shaft, which lines up pretty well with this. And this gave us, and we see the rail cut here. And although this was, um, this was produced in um, 1907, which was before the, the Captain Roberts was, um, was uh, uh, sunk, we can see then um, where the number three shaft is, and then also we can go back and find out where number one is. So we put and you know put line this up on Google Earth. X marks the spot, and we decided to go back. But we before we did, we came across some 1937 aerial photography, also of Sauk County, and we see some remnants on the landscape of where that number one shaft was. So here's your surprise. After tromping through that wetland, here it is. Isn't it obvious? The number one shaft. So um, Paul didn't, uh, so I, I drove up on the drive while Paul and uh, Dennis were walking the wetland. And, um, and I, I heard some hooping and hollering coming from out there. And help pull me out of this thing. <laughs> and um, as you can see with the flagging tape, that is the, um, those are the tie rods which would have held the corners of the um, hoist. And, um, and so he's now marking those in, and John's trying to, to, to see if he can drop down into it. But, um, but they found it merely by chance in walking out to the, the coordinate that they had, uh, had gained. So that's pretty fun. So in the, in the upcoming months, we're going to spend a little bit more time putting some of this together. We collected this data in November, so it's, it's sort of amazing that we're presenting on it now. Um, so when you come to this presentation, again, when we give it, I don't know where, um, it will probably be different and we'll have a little bit more information to give you about what we found, find. 
Meantime, John wants to clear this out. This is his big plan. He's here in the audience. I'm going to make fun of him. Um, to clear this out and possibly see where this one goes. As the other shaft on the Illinois only went down to 130 feet before we hit the bottom, maybe this one is the one that goes down to the 300 or 400 foot level. So we'll never, we'll never know until we actually go, you know? So thank you. I hope there's, uh, we can put another picture here.